Good morning. Welcome to Mulberry Street United Methodist Church on this holiday weekend. We're glad that you are joining us, whether here in person or online. We are a church on mission to share the heart of God from the heart of downtown Macon. And here is how you can be part of that mission uh, this week and moving into future weeks. First, you'll note on the back of your bulletin, the new Enneagram book study that Dana is leading starts tonight. It's not too late to join. Uh, just let Dana know if you'd like to be there. It'll be at 5 o'clock, and it'll be in the parlor? No. Conference room. It'll be in the conference room. Uh, second, a reminder for those of you who have a position on one of our committees uh, on our lay leadership team, we're going to have a special time of commissioning for those folks so next Sunday during this service. So please make sure you are here uh, and ready to be part of that. That will be a time of uh, the lay leadership committing to service to this church and the church committing to the lay leadership to support them in their ministry. Third, the church council will meet for the first time this year, 5.30 p.m. next Monday, January 23rd. And that will be in a new format, and I am grateful to Julia Magda and her leadership in re-envisioning how we utilize those council meetings. Finally, the Daybreak Sleepout, the big fundraiser for Daybreak, is coming up on February 23rd. Uh, I know Creed is working on raising funds for that, uh, and so you can talk to Creed or see details in the newsletter from this week about how to give to that and support Daybreak's great mission to minister with those who face homelessness across our community. Marilyn Armstrong is also a great person to talk to if you have questions about Daybreak or how to support the Sleepout on February 23rd. Again, we are a church on mission to share the heart of God from the heart of downtown Macon. I'm glad you've chosen to be a part of worship this morning. Let's begin with our greeting. The Lord be with you. Let's stand to sing our first hymn.
At this time, I invite Metz and Heidi Whipple to bring Reynolds Metz for baptism. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All of this is God's gift offered to us without price. And now Metz and Heidi bring Reynolds for baptism. Metz and Heidi, I ask you now on behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, repent of the evil powers, of, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If you do, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If you do, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to all people of, to people of all ages, nations, and races, if you do say, I do. And will you nurture Reynolds in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life, if you will say, I will. I will. All right, extended family, if you'll stand, please. Will you, who sponsor and support Reynolds, encourage him in his Christian life? If you will, say, I will. You may be seated. And do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Reynolds now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Reynolds with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his trust of God and be found faithful in his service of others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb, he was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and Reynolds who receives it to wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness throughout his life, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in his final victory. Reynolds Metz, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, I know. 
the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born by water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let us sing to Reynolds as printed on your insert. As a sign of this joyous occasion, we have for you the um, handkerchief with his initials that I used to wipe his head, a baptismal certificate, and a great book. Thank you. You're welcome. Congratulations. children come down and meet me. Hey, sweetness. You are, oh, come here. You are adorable. You want to sit up here with me? Oh, hold on, hold on. No, no. Let's see Lisa, get her. Can you hold this? Hold this. Come here, sweetness. Oh, hey, darling. You want to sit right here with me? Good morning. No? Hey, y'all, I have something to show you. You want to see something? I've got something. What do you got in your hand? Oh, hey, Mama. It's like, hey, go. Go down one more. You got it. There we go. Adorable. Okay. <laughs> it was perfect while it lasted. I love it. You know, I have something to show you. Hang on one second. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to play a game. Pick one. Or y'all got to look at me. Pick one. You picked that one. Okay. Mm -mm. Hold on. <gasps> there wasn't anything in it. I chose oh, no. my goodness. Did I just fool you guys? No. I told you there was something in there. No, you did not say that. I did not, did I? So I didn't lie, did I? Okay, well, let's try this one more time. Try it one more time. Sit up. Try it one more time. Ah, Baxter's almost not trusting me. Oh, wow, this is exactly what, okay, I do have something. But you know that Jesus came to us to save us because we are, what's the big word? Sinners. Do you know what sinners means? 
that we do things that we shouldn't, right? Okay, and so the first thing I did was I tried to fool you, didn't I? I know, I tried to fool you so you wouldn't trust me. Do you still trust me? I know, because I fooled him. Exactly. So that is my point. We should always set the good example so that people trust us, right? We know we can always trust Jesus because he sets that perfect example for us. He tells us the right way to go or the wrong way to go. And are we doing what we should? Okay. So we can follow our friends and do things that we shouldn't, right? Or we can follow people that we believe and trust. And who do we trust the very most? Exactly, Jesus. So, with that being said, he will love you no matter what, even if I tried to fool you. He loves me anyways. He loves me. He loves me when you lay down on the floor, right? He loves you no matter what. He loves you when you don't pay attention and when I don't pay attention. Because, you know, sometimes I get, hmm, what's going on? I don't know, and I don't pay attention to. You like this. Right? That's exactly right. Or you do that. He loves me anyways. So... Trust him no matter what and ignore some things that are not so positive, okay? And sit up and be that man of God that I know you are because you are or you have who in your heart? That's exactly right. And he's going to help you, right? All right, let's pray with Missy Lisa. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for always being with us, even when we make bad choices, and even when we make good choices. You forgive us always. In your name we pray. Amen. Good job, guys.
As we approach this time of preaching, let's pray together. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for you. Unless you speak, nothing of significance will be spoken. Amen. How should we wait? Back in fourth grade, I could not wait for some new Legos to come in the mail. I had saved my allowance and my birthday money to purchase some specific Legos for whatever project I was working on at the time. I was huge into Legos when I was a boy and played with them all the time. I recalled this memory not long ago when I found a journal from fourth grade. At the top of many pages where I had written school assignments and other things, I had a countdown going of how many days left until the Legos came in the mail. As I flipped through the countdown, I discovered something I had forgotten. The Legos were late. They were supposed to take three weeks. I had to explain to Jackson that there was no such thing as Amazon Prime when I was in fourth grade. But even after those three weeks, which was an eternity when you're nine years old, they were late. Each day past the 21st day, I lost more and more patience, writing exasperated things at the top of my page, like, when will they come with many exclamation points and question marks? When they finally did come, I had mixed emotions. I was happy that they had finally arrived, but I was still fuming about how long it had taken. Fair to say, I was not waiting well, which proved to be a theme in my life until recently. About a year ago, I went to Greenbow, the Methodist Prayer Retreat Center located just an hour east of here. During a time of listening and prayer with one of the leaders of Greenbow, I asked him this question. How do you wait well, knowing that I needed to grow in patience? With our future at the time as a family highly uncertain and with many options up in the air, I was finding myself in that pattern just like when I was nine years old, growing increasingly agitated and anxious in the waiting such that the waiting itself, or better put, the way I was handling the waiting, was preventing me from enjoying the things of life. Waiting can do that. It's hard to be patient. How should we wait? With that question in mind, we embark together on a five-part sermon series on patience. I hope that it's helpful to you as we learn together what it means to be patient. And we begin with the Apostle Paul, sharing just a little bit about patience in his first letter to the Apostle Timothy. This is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I, Paul, am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How should we wait? Paul's faith journey is a remarkable one. Born as a Roman citizen to parents of some prosperity, he demonstrated a talent for theology at an early age. He was raised up in the faith to become a Pharisee, and upon completing his training, became one of the most zealous of all Pharisees. He traveled the region, including Palestine, to encourage fellow Jews to uphold the faith. That gradually included persecuting a brand new sect of Judaism that was attracting Gentile believers, a sect known at the time as the Way, later to be known as Christianity. Paul, then named Saul, gained a reputation as one of the most vigilant of the persecutors of Christianity. Famously, in the book of Acts, he looks on as Stephen, the first Christian martyr, is stoned, approving of the proceedings. 
He does so as one of the most zealous proponents of the movement to extinguish the way, which he considered to be a direct threat to the true form of Judaism the Pharisees promoted and enforced. So here in Timothy, when Paul says that Jesus Christ, through him, showed mercy and the utmost patience, we can see why. Jesus put up with a lot of persecution, much bad behavior on Paul's part, before finally appearing to Paul on the Damascus Road, the moment of his conversion. That is tremendous patience on Jesus' part. Many Christians suffered at the hands of Paul and his Pharisees. They lived under fear of what these zealous religious leaders might do. Jesus tolerated much suffering on the part of the people waiting to convert Paul, which would lead us to ask the question of why Jesus waited. Why not convert Paul sooner? Save the persecution of these early Christians, and indeed perhaps have saved Stephen's life. Yes, there's tremendous patience shown, especially patience with Paul's behavior. That's what he reports here to Timothy as a way of encouraging Timothy and those who would read this letter. Jesus is patient with you too. No matter how bad your behavior, no matter for how long, Paul is saying Jesus has patience and will forgive you. It's a powerful message of grace that leads others to find eternal life in Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful message of divine patience that no matter what we have done in this life and no matter for how long and no matter how much we've wronged God, Jesus has patience with us, forgives us, and receives us. But we're still left with that question. Why did Jesus wait so long to convert Paul? In the waiting, while Jesus was showing him the utmost patience, Christians suffered persecution at Paul's hands. Why not convert him sooner? It's a good question to ask, especially as we are sitting upon this journey of learning how to wait well, how to practice patience. How should we wait? As we seek an answer to that question today, consider another question. What are you waiting for? We're all waiting for something. Sometimes it's for things to happen, like how many of us eagerly anticipated the national championship game last Monday. Sometimes we're waiting for people or circumstances to change. There are irritants, people who do wrong to us, things that harm us, uncomfortable situations, and there's nothing to do but grin and bear it. Sometimes we're waiting for our suffering to come to an end. We're dealing with health issues, like the many of us who have been sick recently, or perhaps we have more severe, longer-term health issues. Maybe our suffering is emotional, the result of family or friendship or job issues. Sometimes we're waiting for our work to pay off. We've been laboring and moving towards something, working hard to achieve a goal, but the goal is yet still far off. Or even sometimes we're laboring just hoping it pays off, having no guarantee that it will. Fair to say, we are all waiting for something. And in the waiting, it's all too easy for that waiting to give way to impatience, marked by being irritable, and when waiting through suffering or bearing a hard burden, anxiety. In long-term health issues, in family finances, in family members who continually cause us trouble, in work that never seems to pay off, in so many ways we find ourselves irritable, anxious, stressed, grasping for a sense of control over things while we wait. It's easy to get that way, whether over trivial things like waiting for Legos or more serious things, especially if we're suffering or having to grin and bear it or laboring with no guarantee of anything coming of it. And as our anxiety and irritation grows, impatience can take over our lives, scheming for how we can get things to happen sooner, end the suffering sooner, or somehow just not have to wait, at least not wait as long, robbing us of our joy. That's where I was last January when I went to Greenbow. So impatient, the impatience was robbing me of any joy in life. Bring to mind when you've had to wait 
and grown agitated, irritable, totally impatient in the waiting. Maybe there's something right now in your life, waiting for someone to change, waiting for suffering to end, waiting for someone else's bad behavior to cease, waiting for your laboring to finally pay off, waiting for the circumstances of your life to change, waiting impatiently, irritably, anxiously, waiting. Waiting is hard. And as we grow irritable and anxious, we also tend to grow hopeless. Hopeless that the waiting will ever end. Hopeless that things will work out. We hear the voice of wisdom in our lives say that good things come to those who wait, but that doesn't make it any easier to wait. And then in the waiting, we might ask, what's taking God so long? What's taking God so long to bring our waiting to an end, our suffering to an end? Just like asking with Jesus why he didn't convert Paul sooner while Christians suffered, we might ask why God doesn't act on our behalf sooner, ending our suffering. How should we wait? Throughout the Bible, we see God waiting over and over again. In fact, from the very beginning, we see God waiting. When Adam and Eve sin, God says in the garden, where are you? Waiting for Adam and Eve to present themselves. In the sinning of the people prior to the flood, God is waiting to see if they'll repent. And then when it becomes obvious they will not repent, God waits still longer before instructing Noah to build the ark. When the Tower of Babel is built, God waits a while before destroying the tower and dispersing the people. God shows patience with Abram's lack of faith before he becomes Abraham and with Sarai's lack of faith before she becomes Sarah and pregnant with Isaac. God waits for generations while the people are enslaved in Egypt before acting through Moses to free them. God waits while the people wander in the wilderness building a golden calf out of their impatience when they decide that God isn't acting the way that he should. God is patient with the people once they're in the land again as they sin over and over and over again. Throughout Scripture, God demonstrates patience with the sin of the people time and time again, eventually acting in what the Bible calls the fullness of time. That phrase shows up again when talking about the arrival of Jesus. A Messiah had been promised for generations at least 500 years Scripture says that God sent Jesus in the fullness of time. Another way of saying, at the right time, when God knew things were right. The scriptural witness shows us that God is patient. God is patient in abiding suffering, for God suffers when his people sin. God is patient in bearing the burdens of his people, especially seen in sending and allowing Jesus Christ to suffer. God is patient in not acting until just the right time, in the fullness of time. And God is patient in continuing to labor and work for the good and for the restoration of his people and the world, just like we see Paul testify to in 1 Timothy. God is patient. It's not often how we describe God. We tend to use other adjectives, but but there it is across Scripture. God is patient. And God's example of patience of waiting provides us with the answer to our question this morning. How are we to wait? We are to wait with hope. Things don't happen on our timetable. Suffering doesn't end when we want it to. The burdens we bear don't let up when we want them to. Our labors don't produce when we want them to. But we see again and again in Scripture that God acts when it's the right time, in the fullness of time. And that means that God will act every time. Which is why we can wait with hope, knowing that God will act. The suffering we know won't be forever. The burdens we know won't be forever. Our labors will produce a harvest of righteousness at some point, all because God will act 
And so we can wait with hope, knowing that God will act, turning our suffering, our labors, our burdens, our waiting into good. Our suffering will even be turned to joy. Consider the psalmist who says, you have turned my mourning into dancing. God will redeem our suffering. Evil has caused it, but what evil meant to harm us, God means for good. And in the fullness of time, God will redeem, God will turn that suffering into good. The burdens we carry will be lifted. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In the fullness of time, we will understand that. It will be our reality. God will lift our burdens and carry them for us. God will turn our burden into good. The laboring we're doing, not even sure if it will accomplish anything, will reap a harvest of good. When we're living our lives in faith, God takes our actions and uses them to build the kingdom of God one brick at a time. Our laboring may last for a night, but joy will come in the morning. God will act every time in the fullness of time, which leaves us waiting until that fullness arrives but we can wait without anxiety, fear, or irritability. In fact, we can wait in peace because we have the assurance that God will act. My own life testifies to this. Back a year ago when I was at Greenbow and I asked that question, how do I wait well? I was waiting for my next appointment. At the time, I didn't think I would ever be appointed here. And this is what I wanted the most. So, in consultation, I had been granted the option to pursue an appointment in a different annual conference. And I was applying for jobs at universities as a chaplain all over the country and jobs with other annual conferences. I was getting some traction, but not a ton. So last January, when I looked ahead to June at my appointment at Eastman would end, or when my appointment at Eastman would end, I wondered, where would we be living? What would we be doing? Would everything work out okay? Our family life and our future were entirely uncertain. It's hard to wait in such circumstances. But then, on January 31st last year, I got the call from the consultant you hired to find your next pastor. From there, that path forward became clear, and I knew I'd be appointed here. It wasn't without challenges. It was difficult buying a house and expensive getting settled. There was stress in the move, but God acted. And looking back, I can see that God acted in the fullness of time. I am convinced that this was the right year for me to be appointed here. This was the fullness of God's timing. That is just the latest example in my life of seeing how God acts in the fullness of time at just the right time. In my life, I have seen how God acts at that right time, and that's reason to hope while waiting. So when we're in a season of waiting, I have discovered a powerful tool to help us find a reason to maintain hope. We have hope because we know that God will act in the fullness of time, and so it's helpful to be aware of where God is currently acting and moving in our lives. So that tool is a form of the prayer of examine, and it works like this. Take a moment with a loved one, maybe a spouse or a close friend or a family member, and ask each other these two basic questions. What am I most grateful for today? What am I least grateful for today? At first, it might feel like it's not doing much. The power of examine is in regular practice daily over time. And one of the many joys we've discovered as a family is in doing this practice pretty regularly across our dinner table. We help us, it helps us discover where God is acting and moving in our individual lives and in our lives as a family. Maybe it's Carter pointing out something wonderful that happened to him that day, raising his victory arms as he tells the story. Maybe it's Jackson in the middle of a hard day, yet still finding something to celebrate. For me, 
I had discovered that I more readily see where God is active and moving in my life and am more positive and have more hope while I am waiting through suffering or bearing a burden because that practice of examine helps me see that God is active and moving. And so I can know all the better that God will act in the things I'm waiting for. What am I most grateful for today? What am I least grateful for today? Examine helps us with the waiting by showing us where God is acting. And that's, how, that's the answer to how we practice patience now, while we're waiting. We look for where God is acting. Because where we see God acting around us, we are reminded that God will act in the things we are waiting for. And that is reason to hope. Where in your life can you see God moving today? Maybe not in the burden you carry, the suffering you bear, the laboring you're doing. <clears throat> Maybe elsewhere. But guarantee God is acting somewhere in your life. It just takes intentionality, the practice of examine, to look and see where God is acting. So how should we wait? With hope. A hope born of knowing that God will act in our waiting. How should we wait? By practicing examine to help us see where God is active already, allowing that to inspire hope for the things that we are waiting for. What are you most grateful for today? What are you least grateful for today? God will act every time, in the fullness of time. No matter what you're waiting for, that's reason to hope. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others, and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them, and love one another as Christ loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We offer these prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. standing, let us join together in our final hymn as printed in your bulletin.
And now may the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go in peace.